Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. I said, praise the Lord. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank the Lord this evening. Come on, somebody. I said, we thank the Lord this evening. Hallelujah. Father, we lift up hands to you now, God, first of all, to say thank you. And we recognize that, Lord, it is you who have brought us to this point in ministry. It is you, God, who brought us to this point in our lives. And, Lord, we point to you and say, Father, have your way. We thank you, Lord, for all things in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless those who are already online right now, those who are here in the sanctuary. And, God, we're just going to continue to have an expectation. Because, Lord, we know that you will continue to rebuild your kingdom. We say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in earth as it already is in heaven. Lord, we thank you that your will is being done right now. Father, we thank you that your divine design is upon our lives. God, we ask that you touch now your word. Touch your word, God, so that we, the hearers, O oh Lord, can receive what you have in store for us. We rebuke the enemy right now in the precious name of the Holy Ghost. We say, devil, you have no right, no, no access to us at this very moment. We are vessels to be used in the master's hand. And so we say, thank you, Lord, for using us as you see fit. God, we thank you for those who, oh God, who come week after week and to your presence, Lord, and to your throne room, to receive manna from on high. Lord, somewhere I know in the New, in the Old Testament, you talk about manna that you fed the people, the children of Israel, when they, led, when they were led out of Egypt. How you fed them from your hand. How you fed them meat from your hand. And so, God, today we're thanking you for the meat that you continue to feed us with. Thank you, Lord, that you continue to nourish our spirit, man. Thank you, Lord, that we have food on the table, yes. But more important to our spiritual existence is what you feed our spirit. And so, God, we thank you right now. Lord, the prayer request, the prayer request that we lay before your altar right now, God, we're saying, Father, let them be answered according to your will. Let them be answered, God, according to the need of your people. Father, we thank you that our wants are all encapsulated in when we provide, when you provide our needs. So, God, thank you that you're meeting the need right now. At this very moment, someone did not think that they would make it through the day, but you met the need. Someone did not think that they would have a place in which to lay their head, but you met the need. Someone did not even recognize that they had food, but you provided. So God, we thank you for all things that you provide. Lord, I'm just going to thank you for the upcoming prayer breakfast that we're going to do on the 4th of May. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you already have given provision for that, that the people of God will come and celebrate around the word called prayer. Thank you, Lord, that prayer is still an essential element of our worship before you. Lord, when we grow weary in prayer, there's something wrong with humanity. So, God, we thank you now that as we're praying to you, God, we acknowledge the fact that we are your people. We're the sheep of your pasture. And so we submit to the unctioning of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we say, come and now take control of this vessel. Put in his mouth what you have him to say. Put in his spirit what you have to emerge. And Lord, I thank you in advance for what you're going to say. And Lord, I thank you for the people of God. And we give your name, the honor, and the glory. For it's in Jesus' name, and we say amen. Hallelujah. We give you praise, God. We say hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Do me a favor right now, people of God. Like, tag, and share this ministry broadcast with someone. Do that. Let us do that. Let us be deliberate. Let us be intentional. You know how Bishop is. I'll tell you, when you come to Bible study, always have your Bible. That's the first thing you need. Amen. Have your Bible with you. And not just any kind of Bible. Have a study Bible. Remember, you're coming to study the word of God. No one, not one, any one of us should think that we know it all. I'm not going to tell you I'm a know it all. I'm, I don't know nothing. I'm going to tell you, I know nothing without God. We're not know it alls, but I know someone who knows it all because it's all about him. So tonight, amen, we want to get back into that mindset. 
where God is preeminent. The scripture says, watch this, 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, study to show yourself to be approved as a worker that needs not be ashamed, but one who can rightly handle the word of truth. And I believe if you learn to come to study the word of God, God has a word for you. Amen. So always bring your word so that we can study the word of God. Remember, you're not, you're not trying to study God himself. You're studying the word of God. There's something about studying the word of God, because once you start studying the word of God, God begins to revelate. He begins to unveil and reveal things concerning himself. That's what I love about it. And then not only are we coming with the word of God, but we're coming with pen and paper, some type of device. If you want to record Amen. we're recording for you right now this message so that you can walk away with understanding. Hallelujah. So, again, be deliberate. Like, tag and share this ministry broadcast with someone. We're going to pick up in second installment from last week. We were talking about ships to sail on, but not ships for sale. Your ship should never be up for sale. Amen. You should lift your sail on your ship so that you can sail, but you should never have your ship up for sale, which means the S-A-L-E. Don't ever, don't ever let your ship be for up for purchase. Amen. How many know that you were, the Bible says you were bought, you were purchased with a price? See, once you know that you're the purchase of God, you should never put yourself out and put a sign in front of you saying uh, open for business or that I'm, you know, uh, uh, there's there's a sale, a for sale sign on you. Don't ever have a for sale sign outside of you. Amen. You are, say it with me, I'm purchased already. Hallelujah. Now, there are some people, watch this. There's some people who like to re-gift themselves. What am I talking about? Some of us forget that we're Christian. And we will put ourselves, we will re-wrap ourselves and re-gift ourselves and let the devil have you out being moved around, handed around. If, if, you, if you ever, how many of you all have ever had a, what they call a fruitcake? I know I have. I've had a fruitcake. And, and fruitcakes, amen, seem to get passed around. I got a fruitcake from somebody else, and then I'm saying, you know what? I don't want this thing, so I'm going to give it to somebody else. It's interesting that fruitcakes get passed around. Somebody going to miss the spiritual component of what I just said. You can be a fruitcake and allow yourself to get passed around from church house to church house because you, you, you're a fruitcake. Now, I'm not insulting anybody. I hope I'm not insulting anybody. But fruitcakes get passed from place to place. Tonight, we're talking about ships that are not for sale, but ships that we are to sail on. Last week, we touched on three of them. Let me go back and remind you of the ones we talked about last week so that you can get caught up. We talked about, first of all, um, the first ship that we were talking about is fellowship. That's the ship that we talked about last week, the first one out of the gate. We use John chapter 17, verses 21 through 23. Go there with me real quick. I just want to I just want to give you a refresh. Refreshers are good because you cannot move from where we started last week if you don't get a, get a refresh. So somebody say refresh. Refresh, amen. So in John's gospel, 17th chapter, look at verse 21 to 23. Here's what it says. It says that they all may be one. We're talking about fellowship. This is the ship that you that we sailed out on first. Why is fellowship so important? Because really, if you don't have fellowship in Christ, then Christ cannot really get in you. Let me say that again. We must have fellowship where? In Christ. Let me go ahead and say what Jesus himself was saying. He said that they all may be one. This is the Lord talking to the Father. He says that as you, Father... Are one in me and I in you, he says that they talking about the talking about his disciples, that they also may be what one in us. Notice that there's fellowship between the father and the son. And if there's fellowship between the father and the son, there's also fellowship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For the Bible says there's three that agree in heaven: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then it says, and there's three that agree on earth, talking about you, the individual, the body, the soul, and the spirit. We'll talk about that at some other point. But the point I'm making now is that you cannot have fellowship in Christ 
until you go to him and ask for him to have fellowship with you. As once you have fellowship with him, then you all automatically have fellowship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Notice then, he says in verse number uh, 22, he says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. And in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, are you catching this, that the world may know, this is the key, that the world may know that you have sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. We get all of that and then some. We don't, rec we don't realize just how important fellowship is. We have, we have lost the pandemic really caused a lot of people to lose fellowship. They not only lost fellowship with the Lord, but they lost fellowship with one another. Come on, talk to me. They lost fellowship with the Lord because they no longer saw him as being important to fellowship with. And then they lost fellowship with one another. And the Bible is clear when it says, and forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the practice of some are. So fellowship is important. Then move with me to 1 Corinthians 1, 9. I'm just going to touch on these real quick and we're going to get back to the ones we need to cover tonight. 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says, God is what? Faithful. By whom you were called into where? The fellowship of his son. Notice it says we were called into the fellowship through his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can't make Jesus your savior and expect him to just be savior and not expect him to be Lord. See, savior is being saved from something, but lordship means you submit to him and you get your direction now from him. You're no longer your own captain of your ship. Hello, somebody. You have acquiesced. You have submitted your, what we call your authority to him who now is the authority for your ship. I just need you to understand, you cannot keep sailing your way. You can't keep doing things your way. It must now be that you're allowing Jesus to become what captain of your ship. So that's where we left off. Uh, with respects to fellowship. The second, second point I wanted to make from last week is we talked about what? Discipleship. This is that second ship. Now notice, to have fellowship first, you have to have fellowship with the Lord. You have to go to him and you then have fellowship not only with Jesus the Lord, but you have fellowship with the Father. You have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So you're really having fellowship with three in one. And now we come to discipleship because you cannot be his disciple until you go to him. Once you come to the Lord, you have now become a disciple because a disciple is a what? What does a disciple do? A disciple is a what? Follower. A disciple is a submitted student. Jesus become Rabboni which means great teacher, he now becomes the instructor. He now becomes the one who directs. He now becomes what we call the drum major for your life. So he leads, he guides, he instructs. He's the maitre d'. He is the maestro. He is all of that. So he's the one who is what? Directing. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, which means he directs your steps. So now we know then to be a disciple means you follow. I'm going to get you back where we need to be tonight. But you need to get back to understanding what these other ships. That first ship is what? Fellowship. The second ship is what? Discipleship. And we use for scripture, if you go over to Matthew's gospel real quick, the fourth chapter, verses 18 through 20. Matthew chapter what? Four, verses 18 through 20. And this is where Jesus is calling his disciples. What were they doing? What were the disciples before they were called doing? They were doing what they always did. They were doing the worldly stuff. The first disciple, Sister Lorraine, that Jesus called was Andrew. He was the first disciple. It wasn't Peter. It was Andrew, the brother. Where was Andrew? Andrew was down by the seashore watching John the Baptist baptized. 
And so, but notice what John the Baptist says. He says to everybody, he didn't just say it just to Andrew, but he said it to everybody. Why? Because Jesus was approaching. So he says to everybody, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was coming. And so then not only did John the Baptist say this, but John the Baptist said something else. He says, oh, by the way, whose shoes I'm not even worthy to touch on loose. He says, I want you to look. And then he was pretty much saying, my time is up. My time is to step aside and become a disciple of him. I'm, I've been doing this. He says, I truly have been baptizing with water, but there, here comes one who's going to baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost and with fire. You have to understand, you can't be a disciple of everybody. You can sit in classrooms all day long, all right? But you have to understand there's only one who is truly your teacher. When you're taught by God, when you're taught by the hand of God, when you're taught by the Lord, you have submitted yourself to his teaching. You're, he, John the Baptist understood that someone greater than him was coming. And he was not going to, he was not going to try to stay and hog what we call the limelight. He stepped aside. He stepped down. He said, no, no, no. He says, I done done my part. Someone who's coming to do something greater is now on the scene. And so John the Baptist, matter of fact, John told his own disciples, go follow him. How many pastors would have done that? How many leaders would have stepped aside and said, you know what, my time is up. It's time for you to take the reins. Watch this. In the Old Testament, you see Elijah mm -hmm. doing this. Elisha shows up and says, I'm told to follow you. And Elijah says, if you see, when you see me go up, when you see me go higher, and you're in the right position, he says, the mantle that I'm now carrying is going to fall on you. Hallelujah. And if you know the story, come on, say, I know the story. Say, I know the story. The Bible says that Elijah was caught up in a whirlwind chariot of fire, and he was going up, and Elisha said, I'm not going to leave you, I, I'm going to stay right with you. Everywhere Elijah went, Elisha was right there. He positioned himself to be a receptacle, a student, a student, a disciple, amen. And when he went up, the mantle fell from Elijah and fell on Elisha. And here it is now, Elisha had a double portion anointing. Glory to God. Because why? He stayed where he was supposed to stay. He listened because he was a listener. He was a student because he was a pupil. He was positioning himself to be where he needed to be. Too often, I'm convinced that we as leaders don't lead because we don't have an ability to follow anymore. I'm still a follower. I'm a follower of the Lord. And so I want to continue to make sure that as I follow, I also lead. Hallelujah. So you can't continue to lead if you're not willing to follow. Come on, somebody. So, so a disciple is that follower. And so Jesus here clearly says, he lets us know in this text, uh, chapter four of Matthew's gospel. Amen. Go back there with me so we catch it. In that fourth chapter, look at that, look at that 18th through 20th verse again. He lets us know real quick. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting what? Nets into the sea, the S-E-A. And they were fishers. Remember last week I said, God called you while you're dirty? Amen. The Lord calls these boys, these men, while they were what? They were dirty fishermen. Amen. Not only were they, not only were they, was, were they profession, a dirty profession, but they themselves were still sinful. Glory to God. And so now he says, he says to them, follow me and I will make you what fishers of men. Now it's in verse 20, the Bible says, and they straightway, there was no what? Hesitation. There was no reservation. There was no dilly dallying. They immediately dropped everything. Can you imagine? I'm just, I'm just asking them. Can you imagine dropping everything? your livelihood, and then you go and do the Lord's work. Now, 
I want to I want to preface this because um, Daughter Shabra, you and I were having a conversation. Many times you think that what you were doing in the world cannot be used in God's house. I had to turn around on that. Many of us, we a lot of stuff is being done out in the world, but you can take what God called you from and let God transform it into a usable thing inside of the house of God. I'm going to share this with you because some of y'all, I, I think I'm sure you may remember this. Uh, there, was a, there was a brother named Mark Warren and there was a brother named uh, Mel Max up on the fort before we got started in ministry downtown. And while they were on the fort, I was watching these two brothers. They was doing things in the house of worship. They were doing things on the fort. And then all of a sudden, one day I go to them uh, and I say to them, I said, I, uh, I need you all to consider something. I'd like for you all to become deacons. Oh, my God. It shocked them because I put deacon in it. See, they were doing deacon stuff. If you read, if you read over in, in Acts chapter six, you see deacons did they were workers in the house. They were doing stuff. These two brothers were diligently working. And all I did was give a title to what they were doing. We get panicky because now the title is more, is more you 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 focus on the title as opposed to the act. Don't get caught up in the title. Always perform the act. When you're performing the act, you don't have to worry about the title. I would rather you call me servant, amen, because if I'm not really being a bishop, amen, then I'm, at least let me, let, at least tell me I'm servant. We get caught up. Be a disciple. That's that ship I'm talking about. So so that this, this discipleship is important. The third thing we talked about last week was what? Stewardship. Stewardship. And I know some people really thought I was going down this material thing. They, run, they really thought I was going down this material road, Thomas, but I wasn't going down the material road when I talked about stewardship. Because God says to be good stewards mm -hmm. over his possessions, which means everything God has given you, you should be on your guard with it. Amen. That doesn't mean material things. That means, say it with me, everything. Everything that you do for God should be guarded because he's telling you to be good stewards. I use Psalm 66, 16 because it says, come and let us hear. Come, let us what? Hear. And, and when you come and hear, notice it says, all you who what? Fear God. Why is it necessary to fear God? Because when you fear God, the Bible says that's the beginning of your wisdom. When you fear the Lord, that's where your wisdom begins because you start recognizing and realizing the things I'm now getting ready to walk into, these things are godly things I'm getting ready to walk in. The mantle in which I'm walking under, the, the, the places I'm getting ready to go, God, I'm getting ready to walk into holy territory. And I have to be on my guard. You can't let everybody get so close to you because the things that are precious to you now has to be guarded. Because God is going to be downloading things in you. And notice, you just can't tell everybody what God revealed to you. There are things that God spoke to you and you alone. And he said, don't tell nobody. If you don't believe me, the word of God tells me that. Peter, James, and John are taken up and Jesus is transfigured right in their presence. They see this. They witness him talking to Elijah and Moses. They witness this. And then notice what they said. Oh, it was so good that we were here and we ought to build three altars. And Jesus says these words. He said, don't you go tell nobody what you just experienced. Don't you go tell nobody. Because not everyone was ready to hear what they had experienced. And not everyone is ready to hear what God is, is doing in you because they're not ready for that. Some people will think you have lost your mind. Some people think that you have, that, 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 that you are way out there in, now that's my right, out there in left field, and you're ready for what we call the mental institution. No, there's just some things you can't tell everybody. You have to be on your guard. Are you with me tonight? Hallelujah. We're talking about being good stewards. And then also, if you take a look in Luke chapter, e, uh, chapter 16, look at verse 11. Notice the Bible says, so if you were not 
been, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? What is it that, what is it that you think is worth more than what God has for you? I believe you'll come with the word nothing because the word of God is more precious than silver and gold. Everything that, everything of God is more precious than silver and gold. Watch this. The Holy Spirit downloads this into us right now where he says, what would it profit a man that you would gain the world and lose your soul? What the devil is after is your heart because he knows your heart is connected to your soul and it's connected to your spirit man. He knows that. The Bible says where a man's heart is, there his treasure also. Come on, talk to me. Am I right about it? Where a man's heart is, there is his treasure also. This is why the word of God says, don't store up your treasures where? On earth. Where moth and rust can get to it. Which means what you have down here, what you experience down here, say it with me, is temporary. This right here is temporary. Don't get caught up in a temporary situation. Remember, he says to store up your treasures where? In heaven. Where rust and moth cannot even get to it. Hello, somebody. I'm talking about stewardship. You cannot, you cannot be on this ship if you're not a good steward. A steward is someone who manages the affairs of him who put him in charge. Who puts you in charge of these things? Simpson didn't call Simpson. Hello, somebody. Thomas didn't call Thomas. Entrail didn't call Entrail. Are you with me? God calls you. And watch this. When someone walks into my office and says, God, call me, I have to believe what you just said. <laughs> I have to believe what you just said. But now to a point, now you just, now you just told me I should expect something from you. Because you told me he called you and God does not call somebody and then withdraw his calling. You can walk away from your calling, but the Bible says the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable, which means God won't change his mind concerning the calling on your life. He will not. And this is why, and this is why if you read the book of Acts, you will find out that God had called Judas Iscariot he had called him. The Lord called him to be one of his. If you notice something about in Acts chapter 1, you'll find out. The Bible says, and Judas forfeited his bishopric. He forfeited because what? He walked away from God. If you're going to be a good steward, understand that everything, this ship is so important that you have to be on guard for everything that's required of being a good steward. Amen. I don't know about you, but I love being a good steward. I don't want the devil will not get the satisfaction of having me to squander away what God has given me. Hallelujah. Are you ready now? Are we ready? Hallelujah. We ready for this. We ready for this fourth ship, aren't we? Are we ready? Relationship. Write that ship down. We talked about what? Fellowship. We talked about discipleship. And we talked about what? Stewardship. Now this fourth ship is called relationship how many of i told you last week of all the ships this is probably one of the most meticulous ships that we really need to take full control or should i say pay close attention to relationship relation the root the bottom of relation is relative and relative has a bottom to it it means to relate if you cannot relate to who God is in your life. If you can't relate to him, trust me, you will be late. I would rather relate to God rather than being late. Because the Bible says that uh, in the latter days, there'll be two in bed. One is going to be taken and the other one left. There's going to be there's going to be two working out in the field. One is going to be taken and the other one left. I would rather, see if you notice the one that is taken has a relationship with the one who takes them up. The one who does not relate and cannot relate, they find themselves out on their own. How about us today making sure that we have a relationship 
with the one who we are supposed to relate to. See, when you when you are re, when you relate, when you are relative to God, when you are relative of the Lord, you start sounding like, you start being like, you start walking like. Because why? You are a relative. You are relative. Amen. And, you, and now notice this: we are relative by the blood of Jesus. We might have different color skin, but because of the blood of Jesus, we're all kinfolk. Can I just, can I, can we agree on this? We're all kinfolk. I, I, I was, I was, I was stunned about a, a couple of weeks ago. I was at a funeral right here in the city. And as I was in, I was, I was sitting down uh, at the pulpit and, and uh, all of the relatives were getting up speaking about the one that was deceased. And this young man, he gets up. He's not the same color as everybody else. And he uses, you know, and I'm, I'm saying, okay. At first I was like, wait a minute, that's, that's a nephew. That's a nephew. Or oh, that's a grandchild. And I realized it was a grandchild. And the, the young man, he gets up and he says, he says, I, I, I know some of y'all were looking at me strange when I got up to speak about my granddad. He says, I'm married to his granddaughter. Hello, somebody. And he says, this man, my granddad, he says, he never treated me like I was a stranger. He never treated me like I didn't belong. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there, I said, this young man is really pouring out. He says, I'm going to tell you how important. He says, he says, I was in need because he, he was a veteran. He was a young man out of the military. He says, this man uh, that he was talking about, he says, he took me to the DAV. And as he introduced me, you know, he said, I came through the door and, and the people, the person there looked at him and thought that he was, a, you know, he shouldn't even be there. Because the man had said, my grandson is coming. My grandson is going to come. And when he came through the door, he said, the guy who, who greeted him was stunned because he said, that's my granddaddy. They were different colors. Remember that we are related by blood. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. I said we're related yes. by blood. Yes. You, you, if you keep looking at the exterior of somebody, you will never appreciate the interior redesign. We have been rearranged on the inside. We have been redesigned on the inside. The Bible says Jesus had this conversation concerning the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were always concerned about the exterior. He says on the outside, you're white sepulchers. And on the inside, you're like dead men bones, empty on the inside. You have to learn to relate to Jesus. You have to learn to be a relative of the Lord. This is why the Bible says that we're heirs and joint heirs of Christ. Don't, don't get quiet on me now. I'm telling you, it's talking about relationship. If you're not going to have a relationship with the Lord, the Lord cannot own you. He cannot claim you to be his. Amen. You have to show you have to show your relative that you have some sense. You know, you know, it's a shame that you can go to a family reunion. I don't know where I'm going now. You show up at a family reunion, and there's this one person who acts like they don't even belong. And matter of fact, you might be ashamed to say that's your relative. Why? Because they don't act like. They don't act. They don't act like they got common sense. They don't act like they they are part of the family. Matter of fact, them jokers show up in Ontario. You know they'll stir up stuff, won't they? They will stir up stuff. Of all the other family members, this one shows up and stirs up trouble for everybody else. Chaos. But if you're a true relative, come on, somebody. If you're a true relative of the King, Amen. He calls us sons and daughters. He calls us children. John, John the Apostle, I'm talking about John the Apostle, he said, my dear children, do not believe every spirit, yes, yes, yes. but try the spirit, by the spirit, whether it be of God. You cannot, you cannot assume that just because the person came in well-dressed, well-rehearsed, that they belong to the king. 
You can't make the assumption based on what they dress like. You have to, you have to have to examine. This is what the Bible says: examine somebody. This is what the Bible says: touch, lay hands on no one too quickly. But 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 soon as this person pops up in the house of worship, we're ready to put them to work. They're not relative. Come on. Come on. They don't know how to relate yet. Because they don't have the best interest of the house in mind. If you don't give here, you don't live here. Oh, I'm not talking material. Don't get don't, don't get it twisted. I'm talking about if you don't give of yourself in the worship of one you are to worship, then you have to ask yourself, do can you truly relate to what is going on in the house? Amen, somebody. I'm just trying to help you out tonight. I'm talking about how important it is to have a relationship with the Lord. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Amen. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Praise God. I, I hope this is helping you because I know it's helping me. 1 Peter chapter 4. Let me know when you're there. In 1 Peter chapter 4. Praise God. I'm going to put it on the screen for those who are watching. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look down at verse number eight. Notice something has been said. Can I back up this one verse? Because <laughs> in verse seven it says, but the end of all things is where? At hand. Are you with me? But the end of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober and watch unto what? Prayer. So you and I already know what we should be doing. We're told what to do, and we're told why to do it. We're told the end of all things is, is closer than we recognize. When, when we stand and tell people, you need to get your house in order. You need to get your affairs in order. You need to understand that the end of all things is getting closer now than it ever were. And then he tells you, oh, by the way, don't you go around acting as if nothing matters. Don't you go around playing, you know, playing, uh, uh, you know, the chunk, if you will, you have to make sure that you're what? Sober-minded. Sober-minded. What, what does it mean to be sober? What does it mean to be sober? I want to I want to pause. I told you I'm going I'm to take some moment here with relationship. What does it mean to be sober? Not under the influence of things that can cause you to have a distorted mind. Not under the influence of that which can cause you to have a distorted mind. Why did the Lord say, let the, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, why did, the, why did the Apostle Paul say this word? He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus was not, he did not allow the worship of him when he was coming into Jerusalem to stop him from going to the cross. Can you imagine you're coming in and you're riding a donkey? Royalty usually rode in on a horse, usually. But Jesus chose what we call the beast of burden. He called, he, he said, he said, I'm gonna ride in on the cause the prophet had already said he was gonna come in riding on this type of animal. Because riding on that type of animal meant that he took the posture of what? Humility. He didn't allow, he didn't allow all of the worship. I mean, the Bible says they threw palm branches and their, 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 their cloaks and stuff down and they said, holy, holy, holy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is what they were doing. But Jesus didn't let this go to his, go to his head. He did not. Because he already knew what they were going to do. You praise me one day and cuss me out the next. Hallelujah. Sounds like some of us today. We say, wait a minute, Bishop, we had a good time in service. Hallelujah. Next thing you know, I'm hearing my name cast the Spurgeons out in the public. But you know what? I love you anyhow. Because, because your words don't affect what I'm called to do. Are you with me? Never let the words of someone influence you to walk away from your calling. Never let someone uh, try and pump you up and say, you know what? You can teach better than Bishop. You know, you can do this better than so-and-so. That's the devil trying to pump your pride up so that you don't submit to doing the will of God. You have to understand where we're going with this tonight. I'm trying to get you to understand relationship must first be with your God. 
You cannot have a relationship with me if you don't have a relationship with the Lord. The scripture lets us know the world will know that you belong to him. How? By the love you have one for another. Amen. I have read this book over and over, and I haven't found it here yet where it tell me to like you. I am commanded to love you. Amen. I am commanded to love you. And I have to show forth the trademarks of my relationship with the one who loved me while I was yet in darkness. Come on, somebody. He said, while you were yet sinner, he sent his son to die for you. He loves you beyond what you thought you could be loved by. He loved us just like that. He would never, he would never, if you were in the world, because the question was asked, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, hear my Lord, send me, I'll go. There was no one else, there was no one else qualified in heaven to descend into the earth to then save us from ourselves and from the sin and then us sin back into heaven. There's only one who had that qualification. And the Bible says he is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. This word, this word relationship is more than what you might think it means because we toss that word around so much and we don't understand the magnitude or the impact of what that word is. Now watch what it says in verse eight. Then he says, and above all things, have fervent what? Charity. And the word for charity in the Greek means what? Love. You are to have fervent love, fierce love, overwhelming love. And then he says, among who? Yourselves. Have it among yourselves. And then he says, for love shall cover the what? Come on. It will cover the what? multitude, the many sins. And, and now, don't, don't, don't misunderstand what you just read either. Because it's not your love that covers a multitude of sin. It's his love. His love covers a multitude of sin. He who is love, he who is qualified to love. This is why the word lets us know that he's already proven his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. You may have thought this, you may have thought that you were qualified to put yourself there. No, this love says I cover a multitude of sin. I love you beyond your mess. Only God can do that. Come on, somebody. The Bible says a faith of hope and love. It says the greatest of these three. I know I'm talking right. Hallelujah. I know this word is right yes. because it's about relationship. Go to 1 Thessalonians with me real quick. 1 Thessalonians. Hallelujah. Is this helping anybody out? Yes. I can't speak for nobody. I can tell you it's helping me out. <laughs> this is helping me out. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Are you there? Praise God. In 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to back up a few verses so we get the, the full impact of this scripture, by the way. Notice it says in verse 6. I know I, I know we're going to be coming down to verse 11, but I need you to get to verse 6. Are you there? See, because in verse 6 it says, therefore, let us not, what? Sleep, as do who? The rest, others. But let us, what? Watch and be sober. I know you've seen this before, right? You've heard this before. Notice it says, for they that sleep, sleep where? In the night. They sleep in darkness. And they that be what? Drunken. They are drunken in the what? Night. It's amazing to me when I was out in the world, we didn't get drunk in the daytime. We did it at night. I'm, I'm going to get word letters just for a minute. They said if freaks come out at night. I know I heard that somewhere. Don't y'all get old? Don't you don't you get holy on me right about now? I know you heard it too. Yes. Matter of fact, you probably said it yourself. The freaks. It's thing, it's it's so interesting to me how freaky we become when we don't think nobody's looking. We become freaks and we get freakish. We do some strange stuff when we don't think nobody's looking. <laughs> how, how about me telling you this before I go further? 
How about I tell you that the Bible says night is as day to the Lord's sight. Yes, he says, you can't hide nothing from me. You think, you think you're hiding, but you can't hide nothing from my view. There's nothing that you can hide from my purview. There's nothing that you can think. Matter of fact, the Bible says, as you was already thinking it. He said, I know your thoughts. I know your imaginations. I know all of this. And you're going to try to hide it from me. No, no, no. <laughs> when Jesus himself was talking, he would be in a crowd of people. The Bible says he knew their thoughts. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. He knew they, what they were thinking. And, and what did it just tell me? I can't outthink God. Notice the Bible says in the Old Testament, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And he says, my ways are not your ways. He says, as high as the heavens above the earth, he says, so are my thoughts and my ways different than yours. So I'm not qualified to think on his level. Notice that he says in verse 8, but let us, hello somebody, but let us who are of the what? Day. Now, the context and the revelation of that means because we are of the light as we are of the what light jesus said i'm the light of the world jesus have told us in his word that we're to be salt and what light where in the earth which means everywhere i go i'm to be casting i'm to be displaying the light of christ but you can't have this light if there's no relationship i don't care who you are you can have the title of pastor all day long but don't tell me you have the light of him who, and you're still walking in darkness. That makes no sense to me. So I know that that's a falsehood. You cannot have the light of Christ and yet walk in darkness. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. God forbid. <laughs> Hallelujah. God forbid. This is the word. I'm talking about relationship. Notice here. It says, but let us who are of the day be what? Sober. Putting on what? The breastplate of faith and what? Love. Putting on the helmet of what? And the hope of what? Salvation. Hallelujah. For God has not appointed us to what? Wrath. But to obtain salvation to our Lord or by our Lord Jesus Christ. He who died where? For us. That whether we wake or what? Oh, I love this. Oh my God, I love this. Whether I'm, whether I'm still physically walking around or I'm sleep laying in the grave. It's not about you sleeping in your bed. <laughs> this is about me sleeping in the grave. I'm still resting, hallelujah. Glory to God. This word, this word is just enriching to me. This word is enriching to me because he says, whether we be what? Awake or what? Or sleep. I love that. Whether we be awake or asleep. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Whether we be awake or asleep. Who died for us, whether we be awake or asleep. We should live together with him. Hallelujah. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ shall what? Come down. And we which remain, I'm talking about the one sleeping in the grave. We which remain shall be caught up yes. to meet you. Well, yes. Him, them in the air. Yes. Hallelujah. Because they're not going to go before us. We're going where? Together. Yes. Come on, somebody. That's what it says. We should live together with him. And then here, verse 11 says, Wherefore, comfort one another. Yes. Comfort yourselves where? Together. And edify one another. Even as also you do. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. I hope this is helping you tonight. Yes. And, then, and then we move to this next one called leadership. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but it's important that we grab it. Come on, somebody. Let's grab this leadership. First Timothy chapter five. Go there real quick. I'm going to hasten now. Go to first Timothy chapter five. First Timothy Chapter five. This is the first letter that the spiritual father, Paul, writes to his spiritual son, Timothy. He says to Timothy in first, first Timothy chapter five, go, go down with me real quick to verse 17. Are you there? Notice it says, I'm going to put it on the screen for some of you all that are watching us online. It says, let the elders, 
lives that rule well be counted worthy of what double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine now if you're if you're a true leader amen you won't misuse the scripture many leaders misuse and abuse the scripture because what they're after is material wealth off of the backs of the people and they'll use this scripture but now just because you have the title does not entitle you to the things that God has blessed his people with. Right, right, right. Notice the Bible says the elders that rule well are worthy. That means not everybody's worthy. Come on. Oh, some pastors just got mad with me. There's some leaders out there that just, they just, they, they, they may call me and text me later on and say, Bishop, you done messed up my, you done messed up my flow. Amen. I'm trying to help you out, leader. Because if you're not ruling well, then that means you're ruling poorly. You're ruling badly. It says those who rule well are worthy of double honor. Hallelujah. That means just because, just because you have a pastoral anniversary and you've been not ruling well all year, you should not even be entitled. Oh, I upset somebody. I just upset some folk. I just upset some folk. You know you haven't been ruling well. And yet you expect your people to heap upon you all types of accolades and praise and all types of gifts and so on. And when people get to a point where they're just doing it out of habit, they seem to do it out of some sense of obligation because you didn't set it as an anniversary. This is my pastoral anniversary, so I, you, got to, you got to do this. That. No, no, don't give me nothing if you don't think I've been ruling well. I don't, want, I don't want no petty offering. I don't want that because if I have not been ruling well, then you are not entitled to heap upon me nothing. I don't do this for people's praise, number one. I do this because I want to please the Father. And any leader worth his or her weight in gold should be all about pleasing the Father. You've heard me say this and I'm going to say it to you now. You cannot pay me for what God called me to do. You don't have enough money. I'm trying to help you out, leaders, because this is about the ship that you have to be on if you're going to follow Christ. This is what Paul put it very eloquently. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. He lets you know that if I'm not following him, don't follow me. But then love me enough to grab me and say, Bishop, you're not following Christ. We're going, to, we're going to keep following Christ and you need to come with us because following Christ is essential to where we're going because it's the destiny of humanity to follow divinity. I'm going to say that again. It is the destiny of humanity to follow divinity. If you don't follow divinity, you'll end up in the wrong place. I know I'm talking right. Hallelujah. I'm going to hasten. I'm going to go down to this next one. Anybody need? Anybody want to Fellowship on that one a little bit more. <laughs> Praise God. Now, notice, notice we hinted around this one, but friendship is important. I have to say this up front so that you understand. Facebook that messed a lot of us up. Just because somebody sent you a friend request does not obligate you to answer the request. And the fact that they use the term friend done messed a lot of us up. People put, they put their whole life on blast. I thought so-and-so was my friend. See, we have allowed, we have allowed that word to lose the true essence yes. of its meaning. Yes. Yes. I need you to rethink those friend requests when you get them. Rethink what it means. That's really an association and you can't associate yourself with just everybody. Hello, somebody. You just can't do that to yourself. You have to be careful of who you're letting use that word about you. 
Well, I'm friends with so and so on Facebook. <laughs> I'm friends with so and so on Facebook. I ain't seen the Joker. Don't know what they look like. I don't know them from Adam or Eve. They can pass me. Let me tell you. Let me tell you something. I got to share this with you. I was in Texas at a conference, and I was at this hotel that I never in my life visited. Pastor was upstairs, and and I and she told me, "Honey, can you go down to the lobby and get some?" I go downstairs to the lobby, and and while I'm there, somebody said, "Hey, Bishop Simpson." I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, "Can nobody know me here?" There's no way. I haven't been to this hotel. This is the first time in the city. But this person was connected to me on Facebook. <laughs> but because my connection with them was on Facebook, was one where they were followers. We had a relationship. That friendship was easily acknowledged. There's some folk you don't want to acknowledge. Right. Because if you go to their Facebook page, it might cause you to be guilty by association. You might not realize who you're connected to. So I'm telling you, be careful of who you who you give a friend request to. Go to their Facebook page and take a look down. Go down. Don't just leave, don't just look at the last thing they posted. Go down. They may have posted something scripturally the last time, but go down. You will find something deep down that you will want to know. That's all right. That's all right. I'm, I just might be by myself. Praise God. I'm just trying to help you out tonight. But you got to go, you got to dig deep on some of these things before you say confirm. Before you confirm something, make sure there's an affirmation that it's okay to have a relationship with this person. And now you want to have a, what we call a friendship with this person. Go to Proverbs chapter 18. I'm just about done. I'm just about done. Hallelujah. We just, we'll go over just a little bit tonight, a little bit. I'm not going to stop at 7 PM. <laughs> we're going to go over just a little bit. So if you have to go somewhere, go ahead and go, but I'm just telling you up front, we're going to go over a little bit tonight. How about we go to Proverbs 18, 24? How about we do that? Notice the scripture says, a man who has friends must himself be what? Friendly. I'm going to pause for a minute because it's interesting at in how this scripture is used. A man who has friends must himself be what? Friendly. There are people who on one hand, they're friendly until they're no longer friendly. Come on. They're friendly only because of what they want to get from you. They don't want to be friendly for you to get something from them. There's an ulterior motive why, first of all, they're trying to be friends. I'm just trying to help somebody out. I'm telling you, when, when someone shows up smiling in your face, don't, don't, don't think that smile is them wanting to be friendly with you. They're trying to, they just might be trying to get something from you. So you, you, what, what am I saying? Friendship is deeper than a smile. If David had been where David was supposed to be, if David had been out with his men leading his men, as opposed to being upon up in, his, up in his upper room, glanced out and saw this beautiful woman sunbathing on her rooftop. Uh, Y'all got to help me out. Y'all got to help me out tonight. <clears throat> I cannot believe that Bathsheba didn't have a hidden agenda. Mm -hmm. yes, 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 yes. I'm going to, some theologians right now probably say, wow. What? Come on, come on. See, because see, cause I'm convinced yes. that people knew that the king didn't go out with the men. Everybody knew. When the king left the city, everybody knew the king was out of the city. Right. Why today of all days would Bathsheba go up on the rooftop of her house come on. and sunbathe nude? Come on. 
I just I, I just want people to consider that Bathsheba may just have a had had a hidden agenda. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> oh, somebody said, Oh, I hadn't thought about this, Bishop. I hadn't thought about this. I'm I'm just trying to understand. I'm trying to get you to understand. When Bathsheba was sent for, naturally she's gonna, yeah, the king called for me. I gotta go. I gotta go. The king called for me. We know the rest of the story, don't we? They befriended each other. Matter of fact, they ended a pact with each other mm -hmm. to lie. Yes. It wasn't just one way. Mm -hmm. It was a two-way thing. Yes, it was. And every person that smiles in your face just might have a hidden agenda. Mm -hmm. Be careful of the smile, is what yes. I'm saying. Be careful of the niceties, what I'm saying. Right. Be on your guard with your friendship. But this friendship says, watch this word, this word but there's a what? Friend who sticks closer than a brother. Which means your blood relative will turn their back on you. But the Lord says in Joshua chapter 1, he says, I will never leave you and nor will I ever forsake you. And the Lord says, be strong and be very courageous. Joshua, be strong. Everybody else may leave you, but, but, but get this. He said, I'm a friend that sticks closer than your blood brother. I'm not going to abandon you when things go south. I'm not going to walk away from you when your life goes topsy-turvy. I'm going to be right there with you to help you through your ups and your what downs. I'm going to be right there. I'm not going to ever leave you. Now watch this. You can leave God. You can walk away from him, in other words. You know what? I don't know anybody who will want to walk away if you really consider the promises of God. Who would want to walk away from the promises of God? Because the promises of God are yes and amen. amen. Thank God for his promises. And just because you might feel blessed, there's, a, there's something greater than blessings. Promises are greater than blessings. Promises are greater than blessings. Blessings happen to both the just and the unjust. Why do I know that? Because the scripture says the Lord, he allows the rain to shine on the just as well as the unjust. He allows the rain to fall on the just as well as the unjust. So in other words, this, that joker who don't really deserve this rain is getting rain on too. Hello. The one who don't deserve this sunshine, sun is shining on them too. Those are blessings. But then promises come. Promises of God. The songwriter says, I'm standing on the promises of God. What do you mean? Every promise that he made, you become a recipient of because you're, the, you're a friend of God. I heard the song say, I'm a friend of God. Hallelujah. I'm a friend of God. Hallelujah. So we now understand that there is one. There's only one who sticks what? Closer than a brother. I'm going I'm to end with this one tonight. This is, this is my closing one. The last one we want to deal with is called, and it is the most important of all these ships. This is one, this is the, there's no other ship that's more important than this ship. It's called Lordship. This Lordship is also, is also called a warship. This Lordship comes alongside of a worship. We must worship him where? In spirit and also in truth. So his lordship requires our worship. His lordship requires our worship. Look at what it says in Psalms 103 verses 9, verse 19. Are you there? Psalms 103 verse 19. Put it on the screen. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all the lord has established what his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all i'm a child of the king and wherever i am the kingdom of god rules over all the devil has no authority that supersedes God's sovereignty. Because wherever 
the Lord, when he got up on that third day morning, he said, all power has been given unto me, both in heaven and in earth. I'm talking about lordship. Galatians 2.20, go there with me real quick. Just about done. Galatians 2.20, we're going to close it right on this. Galatians 2, verse 20. Remember, you are an expected participant in the kingdom of God. You are an expected participant in the Lord of, in the house of the Lord. You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen generation. You are a peculiar people. Do you know who you are now? I'm just asking the question, do you know who you are? I'm telling you who you are. And because of who you are, it says in Galatians 2.20, you have, we have, I have been what? Crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who does what? Lives in me. And the life I now live in where? While I'm still here. The life that I now still live while I'm in the flesh, I live it by what? Faith. In who? The Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm talking about the Lordship. His Lordship, his highness. He who's seated on the throne. He who, uh, he who is to be worshipped and worshipped alone. There's no worship higher than the worship of him who created us. The Bible says, for it is no longer I that live. I'm still in this body. I'm still in this flesh. But guess what? Who's living in me? Christ who lives on the inside of us. Amen. For greater is he that is within you than he that is where? In the world. I might be walking around and you're seeing something in the flesh. But who you, who you really are missing is who's the greater on the inside of you. The greater is on the inside of us. When I tell people there's greatness in you, that's because I know you have a relationship with him. If you don't have a relationship with him, I can't say you have greatness in you. You have potential to be great. <laughs> you have potential to be great, but right now you're walking around defeated. Why? Because you don't have a right relationship with the Lord. You have to develop this relationship. God wants us to have what? He wants us to have a relationship with him because he wants to be what? Lord of us. My worship for his highness. Lord, we lift you up. We lift you on high. Just as Moses lifted up the staff in the wilderness, so shall we lift him up. Because if he be lifted up, all men shall be drawn to him. People are not drawn to you because you dress well. They're not drawn to you because you talk well. They're drawn to you because of who's well in you. The wellspring of life should be springing up on the inside of you. The word of God should be springing up on the inside of you. Because out of your belly should flow rivers of living water. I'm talking about who? I'm talking about who occupies the greatest place in you. And that's our Lord. I don't just call him Savior, but I call him Lord. I don't want to just call you Savior God. I want to call you Lord. It is for us to worship and bow down. He is our, he is our master. These ships that we didn't cover these past two weeks, these two nights now, last Wednesday and tonight. I want you to go back and study these ships. I want you to set these ships a sail in your life. Set them a sail in your life. Always remember that on each one of these ships, Jesus is the captain. He is the master of the sea. In other words, I'm not talking about the SEA. He's the master of the SEE. -E. Every significant emotional event in your life the Lord can master them there should not be an emotional thing that will cause you to get off your, your spiritual course and the spiritual journey on the sea of life 
you should continue to set sail. Be just like, amen, the Lord himself when he got up and he said, oh, you have little faith. Have, how long have I been with you? Don't you know that I'm the, I'm the king of everything? He stood on the bow of that ship and he spoke to the winds that they were scared of. He spoke to the waves that caused them to be concerned. He spoke to the thunder and the lightning. He made sure they understood, I'm in control of it all. He controls it all. When you learn that every significant emotional event that Jesus is the captain of, nothing should cause your life to be disturbed. And I mean that with my sincere heart right now. Nothing, there's not a significant emotional event that you can go through that God cannot master because Jesus is the captain. Hallelujah. With our heads bowed as we go before the Lord right now, Father, I thank you. Holy Ghost, I recognize that you came and you took over the class. Thank you for being who you are, our teacher. I became a pupil in the midst of the classroom itself. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for always showing up and doing what you do best. Can't no one do it better than you. And Lord, I thank you that you allowed us to be in this classroom tonight. That we came with open hearts. That we came with a ready mind. And you wrote upon the tablets of our hearts. We came in blank, but we're leaving full. Thank you, Lord, that you've written on every aspect of us. That we walk out better than we came in. Oh, Lord, thank you tonight. For every man, woman, boy, and girl. Thank you for those who have parked themselves tonight. To learn to be fed from your throne room. Thank you for feeding us, Holy Spirit. Thank you for the fresh manner that you give us. Lord, we count ourselves blessed and we thank you that we're kids of promise. We thank you that we're promise keepers. Thank you for keeping your promise with us, Lord. Lord, we give your name the exalted praise. For all of us, Lord, as we get ready to leave this place, those who watched us virtually, Lord, may you continue to bless and glorify yourself. And Lord, may the next time we get together that we understand these ships, they must set sail in our lives. The most important ship that we talked about was the Lordship. And the Lordship requires our worship. And so, God, we worship at your feet and we give you praise. We ask this in Jesus' name. And the saints of God say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. Come on, I say, give God praise. Give him the exalted praise. Hallelujah. People of God, we thank you. Saints of God, we glorify the Lord. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. If you have opportunity on Sunday mornings, amen, tune in with us also at 10 a.m. Arizona time. Amen. As we uh, get into the very worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we, we are so honored for what God is doing and what he has already done. Hallelujah. So be blessed. And until next time, we, give you, we bid you good night and may the Lord bless you richly. Hallelujah.